Hello everyone! In this video, we will be discussing the basics of photography and go over some tips before you start venturing out with your camera. Now that you have an understanding of how photography originated as the camera obscura and how the camera has evolved over the centuries, we can now start talking a little bit about how to properly take photos and how to be prepared for some obstacles you may come across while doing so. Just to clarify, this video is part two of Intro to Photography. Just to keep things simple and easy to follow, we will avoid being too technical, as this video is intended for beginners of photography. Those interested in getting into photography will notice that there are a wide variety of cameras, camera models, camera brands, lenses, and other types of equipment out there. On top of that, cameras and camera equipment can go for hefty prices, making photography a pretty expensive hobby to take up. But this should not discourage you from using what you might already have at your disposal. While the fancier, more technical, and more expensive cameras tend to be seen as more desirable when shooting, it is very important to acknowledge that in the end, the person or the photographer themselves is what makes the image, and the camera is just the tool to make that image become reality. In photography, this is commonly referred to as vision. A photographer's vision is what dictates the entire composition of the images that they take. When shooting serious photography, all elements in your viewfinder should be taken into consideration. The goal here is to try and project what you see through your lens and to capture it on camera. While everyone else might be able to see the same view as you do, you want to try and make the image more interesting and most importantly, make it your own. There are numerous factors a photographer should pay attention to when they are ready to start shooting. While we can't always name them all, here are some simple ones to keep in mind. Lighting situation. Is your composition too bright? Is it too dark? This will determine how vivid your image will turn out and you will always want to have well-balanced images. Symmetry. Is your composition straightened? Is it crooked? Are you cutting off any important parts of your composition that might affect the overall image quality? Details. Details are important, especially in compositions that have a multitude of colors, patterns, objects, or writing and symbols that may be present in your image. It's important to capture details, while also not overdoing it, as you don't want viewers to be confused at what they're looking at, or what you intended for them to look at. Trying to capture too much at once may prove faulty and you will lose the viewer's attention very quickly. Before heading out with your camera, there are some things you should always make sure you have covered. Let's discuss some of these rather simple but common mistakes photographers make that can easily be avoided. Make sure your batteries are charged. Many photographers tend to have several batteries on them when venturing out for a photo session, whether that may be in a lighting studio or somewhere out in the world. Wherever that may be, make sure to have some spare batteries on you, and most importantly, make sure they are all charged up and ready to go. This is crucial to plan at least a day before if you plan to go on an extensive photography excursion. In case the battery in your camera is running low, you want to make sure you have others you can quickly replace it with so you can capture as many images while you're out. Storage. Before venturing out, Always make sure you have sufficient storage space with you, whether that may be an SD card, micro SD card, or some other type of memory card. Make sure you don't forget it, as this is actually a more common mistake than most people would like to admit. Also, make sure you know how much storage is on your card before you go on a lengthy shoot. All photographers have run out of space at one point in their careers while shooting, and were usually faced with either the choices of deleting some images from their camera or just calling it in for the day. Easily avoid this situation by making sure you have enough space. Bring a lint-free or other lens-friendly cloth. Sometimes the lens on your camera can get dirty, fogged up, or exposed to dust easily. To ensure that your compositions are clean and spot-free, consider always having a lint-free or microfiber cloth on hand to wipe your lens whenever you may need to. You will want to avoid using your shirt or other type of clothing material to wipe down your lenses, as they are not meant to be used on them. By wiping your lenses with the wrong types of cloth, 
you can potentially scratch and damage your lenses. Lenses can be very expensive, so having a camera-friendly cloth can prove to be a very worthy investment. Consider a protective camera bag or backpack. It is always a good idea to have either a camera bag or specially designed camera backpack with you. Not only can you store your camera tools, equipment, and other necessities in it, but it will also serve as a protective place for you to store your camera when it is not in use. While most DSLR cameras nowadays come with a lanyard or strap by default, wearing your camera on you for long periods of time can cause strain on your neck, particularly when you are not shooting. Back up your photos. After taking photos, it is important to upload and back up your shots to your computer or cloud storage service after each session, especially lengthy ones. As mentioned previously about knowing how much storage is on your SD card or other memory card, it is equally important to make sure you don't lose all of the images you have taken thus far from any number of disasters, such as losing your memory card, your memory card becoming damaged or defective, or even worse, losing your camera. After each upload, you can even delete them from your SD card once they have successfully been uploaded and backed up, as a way of freeing up space on your card for the next time you go shooting. It is important to remember that becoming a serious photographer doesn't just happen overnight. While the act of snapping photos may seem like a simple endeavor, and can be done by anyone of all ages, this is simply not always the case. Photography is both a technical process, as well as an art form that is layered in various techniques, shooting styles, and lighting situations. When first starting out, it is important to take baby steps and an elementary school approach to photography so that you can build on top of what you learn as you go. The first things to learn when taking up photography are the terms that are commonly used to explain and, I and identify various things in the construction of images. Let's start with ISO which stands for International Standardization Organization, mainly refers to the camera's image sensor's sensitivity to light. The lower the number of ISO, the less sensitive your camera's sensor will be to light. Theoretically, you may think that having a higher ISO would be better in regards to taking photos, but this is actually the opposite. It is generally preferred to have a lower ISO and as low as you can possibly have it. The higher the ISO on your camera will typically yield unfavorable results, including more grain and more noise will be present on your images, which are both things you usually want to avoid. For beginner photographers, ISO 400 is considered to be a pretty standard ISO and highly recommended. As you progress further in your experimentation of shooting, you can gradually upgrade your ISO depending on your various lighting situations. While ISO 400 is considered to be standard, a 1600 ISO is considered to be a high ISO. To make this simple, you can first determine what type of photography you are going to be doing. Speaking generally, if you are going to be doing outdoor photography, you can keep your ISO at 400 or preferably even lower, around 100 to 200 ISO. This would also require you to gauge the type of weather you are shooting. If you are shooting in a sunny and with blue skies environment, you could take some clear pictures with either 100 to 200 ISO. If you are shooting indoors, this is where things can get tricky. Shooting indoors typically means you are not shooting with natural light and are probably shooting under artificial light, which would require your ISO to be higher, such as with 800 or 1600 ISO. As before, you will have to gauge your lighting situation and environment first to determine if you want to crank up your ISO to suit your camera. Many standard cameras go up to at least 1600, while newer and more advanced cameras have much, much higher ISOs, as all cameras can be different and offer different capabilities. However, for beginners, it is advised you experiment with your own camera's capabilities first and be familiar with the different ISOs before moving on to higher ones. Aperture is another important part of understanding photography. Aperture is the size of the opening of your camera's lens. Adjusting your aperture means to adjust the size of the hole in your lens, which will determine how much light enters your camera. Aperture is determined by a set of numbers, and generally, the smaller the number, the bigger the hole or opening of your lens will be, and the higher the number, the smaller the hole will be. 
These are referred to as f-stops. Something to keep in mind is that the smaller the number of f-stop, more light will be allowed through your lens, because the hole will be bigger. The larger the number of f-stop, less light will pass through, because the hole will be smaller. Some cameras, as well as different types of lenses, may offer more capabilities. Another thing to keep in mind, the more f-stops that are available with the lens, the more expensive the lens will be. When working with aperture, you will also be working with depth of field. Depth of field is how much of what's in front of your focal point and how much of what's behind your focal point is out of focus or blurred out. It is important to remember, the lower the f-stop on your lens, you will have a smaller depth of field, and the higher the f-stop, the larger depth of field. You might be thinking, how do all of these things work together? A simple way to remember their significance and what they are used for when shooting is that the first thing you want to do before shooting is to set your ISO. Setting your ISO will be determined by your actual scene and the environment you are shooting in. Next, you will want to set your aperture, which will be based on the subject you're going to be shooting. Both of these go hand in hand when it comes to crafting the technical aspect of your images, so be sure to remember why they're important and what purpose they serve. Another important aspect to know is shutter speed. Shutter speed is essentially how long the camera shutter, or opening, is kept open, allowing light onto the camera sensor. Shutter speed will be determined by time, in seconds. They will be marked as 1 50th of a second, 1 100th of a second, 1 500th of a second, and so on. Shutter speed can even go all the way up to 1 8,000th of a second depending on the type of camera you are using. Shutter speed can help you control motion blur, which is when trying to capture moving subjects. Capturing motion blurs will typically require you to use a tripod using slower shutter speeds, depending on the type of images you are trying to shoot, such as landscapes or even capturing some nighttime aerial shots. Most commonly, however, shutter speed is used for action shots, such as in popular sports photography. To accomplish this, faster shutter speeds will be needed in order to capture the desired actions at the right time they are done. Shooting action shots of any kind would not be possible without adjusting your shutter speed to a higher one. When shooting these action shots from a sim simple action such as running, 1 800th of a second is a pretty standard high shutter speed but really depends on what you are trying to capture. When shooting fast-paced events such as sports, the range for shutter speed can go from 1 800th up to 1 1,000th of a second and beyond. To bear in mind for using shutter speed, slower shutter speed equals more motion blur. Faster shutter speed equals less motion blur. It is important to experiment with these basic foundational skills when taking up photography. It is equally important to remember that it can take time to get used to, and really getting a feel for how all of these components go together. While you practice and experiment, try to record your observations when shooting in a variety of lighting situations, shooting a variety of subjects, both moving and non-moving, and playing around with your camera's capabilities, and making sure you are comfortable using it. Becoming a good photographer can take a lot of time and patience. For some people, more than others, but of course, this is not a race. Always keep in mind that you should take as much time as you need to understand all of the basics of shooting first, before tackling new and more complex techniques, or investing in expensive cameras, lenses, and equipment. Remember to make use of what you currently have and make sure you are comfortable with it. And don't forget that in the end, the camera is just the tool to capture the image, but your vision is what truly makes the image.